Hi, everybody. This is Al Filreis, the faculty director of the Kelly Writers House. I'm, alas, not at the Kelly Writers House, but I'm only about eight blocks away. And we are very excited to have as our first 2021 Kelly Writers House fellow, the absolutely, utterly amazing, amazing Erica Hunt. And so we're going to begin by having everybody who's watching us on YouTube, and many of them are actually putting comments into the YouTube chat, to get your hands off of your keyboard and wherever you are around the world, snap your fingers <laughs> for Erica Hunt. Erica, it is just such a delight. First and foremost, we wanna thank Erica for joining us for four events in two days, two of them public. The first was a long session with the members of the Kelly Writers House Fellows Seminar, the students who with me and Lily and Amber Rose Johnson and Anna Safford have been studying and discussing, intensely grappling with Erica's work for the last month. That is the core activity of Writers House Fellows. Uh, but of course, we have this event, which is a public reading, followed by tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time, a conversation interview that I will moderate. We hope you'll all come back for that. We'll make sure that we resend the YouTube link for that. Join us at 11 a.m. Eastern time and post questions directly to Erica, and we'll have a really good conversation. Tonight, we are going to have a, a reading, very excited about it, and following the reading, we'll have a little time for Q&A. So what we'd like to encourage you to do, and you, you don't need much encouragement because you're all over this, this YouTube chat, um, we'd like to encourage you to pose comments and questions during the reading. And Lily Applebaum, who I'll introduce in a minute, will be picking these up as we go along. So uh, you've already anticipated what I'm gonna ask you to do, but I'm gonna ask anyway, I'd like you to say hello if you're watching by YouTube and you'd like to say hello so that Erica knows she's got an audience here. Ron Silman says hello and Davey Niddle, Jenna Osman, I see, Jayla Rhodes, Tyrone Williams, uh, Sanjeev from Boston and so many others. Divya Victor I saw earlier there. You've got quite a crew, Erica. I guess it's time for us to wave hello to them. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is ask Lily Applebaum, who is the extraordinary coordinator of Writers House Fellows, to tell us about a special gift and a special treat for our viewers. And then she will turn it over to Allison Del Pino, who will introduce Erica and we'll have our reading. So Lily Applebaum, hello, and thank you again for your extraordinary work as the Writer's House Fellows Coordinator. And what would you like to tell people? Thanks, Al. Um, I'm so excited to convey that we have a special gift for Erica and something that we can actually snail mail to your home, Erica's home, and also you, the viewers of the Writer's House YouTube. Um, oh, look, and Al has a copy. I have a a copy as well. <laughs> um, you know your copy and I'll read this, the line. Sure. This is a letterpress printed postcard that we can mail with many, many thanks to Mary Tassilo at the Common Press. This is part of her postcards series. She's been mailing one per month and all of the spring semester postcards are gonna be Writer's House Fellows takeover, quote unquote, of that series. So here comes the first one. It's the final stanza in Erica's poem Reader, we were meant to meet. Um, and Al, I don't know if you wanna. I will be happily, happily <laughs> read it. And, and we'll, we'll hope that you maybe as an encore, Erica reads this poem. It's become anthemic for us here at the Writer's House. Reader, we were meant to meet. And we talked a lot about this concept this afternoon during the fellows seminar. Uh, the last stanza reads, touch reader, we were meant to touch, to exchange definitions and feed the pulse of language. I promise if you step in, it will propel you, me, it, topple distinctions, ease doubt and belief, and all that in between. So if you want a copy, we have limited supplies. What should they do if they want a copy mailed to them? If you would like a postcard mailed to you, all you have to do is write to the Writer's House Fellows email address, which is wh fellow 
at writing.upenn.edu. As soon as I'm done speaking, I'll put this information in the YouTube chat. So if you're watching, you'll be able to see that. Um, so if you send me an email with your mailing address, um, I, you know, uh, we do have limited supply, but I think we'll be able to get you a copy of the postcard. And um, I'm so excited to be able to do that. It's a little um, way of extending this Writers House Fellows tradition of making this letterpress printed ephemera available in person, which we so wish we could be with all of you. Fantastic. And it's now time to turn to Allison Del Pino, who is a student and very involved. Lily, did you want to introduce her? I do. Oh, but I, I wanted to say one last quick thing, which is that um, after tonight's reading, I'm pretty sure you're going to want to purchase a copy of one of Erica's books, possibly this wonderful book, Jump the Clock. Um, and I would just encourage you to purchase the book from your local bookstore, but especially here in Philadelphia, we have a little partnership with Harriet's Bookshop, um, where they are featuring books from our programs on their website. And so if you purchase through bookshop.org, the local bookstore will get some of the um, profits from that and just an all around better venture to support than, you know, Amazon and all of that. So I'll also put a link to that in the YouTube chat. And a shout out to Nightboat Books that has published so many, a thanks. marvelous book. Okay, so um, now that that business is out of the way, I'm very excited to introduce our wonderful student, Writer's House staff member, all around seminar all-star, Allison Del Pino, who is going to give Erica a proper introduction to tonight's reading. So Allison, please take it away. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it was really amazing to be studying Erica's work uh, these past few weeks and to get to speak to her this afternoon. Um, okay. It must be love if while beside you, I think of you and don't fall in. This sentence is from Erica Hunt's preface to local history, her first book. As we in the Kelly Writers House Fellows Seminar have staked our journey through Hunt's poetry over the past five weeks, it is this love that has come up the most. What does it mean? What strengths are required, Hunt's poetry asks, to meet another meaningfully without already having poisoned the encounter, without the dismembering logic of capitalism, without the all-seeing blind eye of stereotype. What is the love that moves one, exhausted, to take action for another from within the most numbing of storms? What is the love that allows people to exist, not as numbers, not as statistics or units of labor, not as a group already defined or as an arcade of stuck on meanings, but as people? And are we even prepared to meet them on those terms, on no terms? Our class is an undergrad class. In it are freshmen who have taken their first year of coursework online due to a world pandemic, and seniors like myself who are readying to dive into uncertainty after graduation. When everywhere we look, many of us only see possibility contract, Hunt shows us what it would mean to love in a way that opens up new possibilities. This, I think, describes the role of the artist. We are all often lost, misguided by our loneliness. And it is the artist who reminds us that others are alive, that this life is an incredible thing, and that learning to reach across the storm to meet another, palm to palm, may be one of the most worthwhile experiences we ever know. Touch reader, we were meant to touch, the speaker of the poem calls out to exchange definitions and feed the pulse of language. I promise if you step in, it will propel you, me, it, topple distinctions, ease doubt and belief, and all that in between. Erica Hunt's poetry is lucid, mesmerizing, and not disorienting, but reorienting. Through it, we get a sense of the importance of honoring loss at the same time that we remain open to connection and how the two depend upon each other. It is an ancestral memory that both haunts and guides us through Hunt's work, 
The ghost is a metaphor, a cipher, a conscience. The past rises in the morning with the present, and the present is the future in play. Through radical love, we can redefine history, make new languages for that which we yearn to utter, connect across the harshest of boundaries, and live meaningfully and in community. I am so honored to welcome Erica Hunt as our first Kelly Writers House Fellow for 2021 to our community. Thank you, Allison. Erica, we are so honored and excited. Well, thank you. And um, thank you, Allison. That was a beautiful introduction, um, helping me to locate what's utopian in my writing and optimistic. I said this afternoon that I, um, in some ways, you know, um, carry within me that Gramscian, that Gramscian um, directive to maintain um, optimism of the will, even as I have pessimism of the intellect. And there's a, it's, a, it's a always in balance and always in conversation um, in my poems. And, um, but I feel that it's important to, um, to exercise both those muscles, both the will and the intellect, as well as the heart, all those muscles um, to, to be in conversation with each other. Um, uh, indeed, it's the only way forward. So um, uh, I'm just gonna start. Oh, before I start, also thanks also to Al and to, and to, um, to Lily um, and to the students uh, in the, uh, the undergraduate students in the contemporary poetry, contemporary literature seminar for uh, generously spending um, so much time with this work. Um, uh, Jump the Clock is an amalgamation of several books and then some unpublished poems. And I realized I have even more unpublished poems as I was looking around to think, oh, what, what will I read? I you know, then discovered more. So, um, so there's, um, it variously collects uh, four or five books, uh, jump the clock. Um, I wanna thank Al and the entire community of Kelly Writers House for providing a place for poetry. Um, Penn Sound is an amazing archive. Every writer, every teacher of poetry depends <laughs> on Penn Sound to help activate the language that we encounter on the page and to show our students and ourselves that the poem exists on the page. That's an important dimension. It's performance and the way it is, um, you know, it is, um, catalyzed in the air, how we voice it is as important as its um, print. Um, in some ways, anticipating the virtual community that we're, we find ourselves in, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're sometimes never gonna meet a poet in person, but we can encounter them in an important way um, online. I'm going to um, I'm going to just read through the book for a while, and then I will also read some new poems. I'll start. I'm going more or less chronologically. The order of the story. One. Imagine yourself walking into a room. The exercise suggests, and then describe how you fill the doorway, the direction you dress in, the way you walk out of the frame. Imagine finding stones, the inscriptions that predicted you. Invent the language now, invent the language as if each inflection belonged to you instead of containing you or treating you as if you were a commotion in the path of progress. Invent a language to describe the doorway in the person, eyes growing accustomed to the dark till the dark has layers peeling off in shiny blue slices. Here and there flashes as the tongue licks over the heart. 
Describe the figure the doorway supports. Into this trope come declensions. All the detail her mortal frame can claim, stick and join. Where the mind's orbit has faded into thoughts disguised as recalculation. Where she shows signs of adjustment. She's a walking chainsaw in crinoline and spandex. She's a smile outlined by her name. Describe where the heart goes in and out of her, where the exits are marked. Indicate which team she's on. Oh, she's on the team of moms for the love of them. However, the bread gets sliced. Describe the butts in the doorway, in the doorway and everywhere in between. where She trips or slides down them into some other contingency. She's a sentence with a dangling clause. She is the figure in the vicinity of her experience with its distracting claims on her attention. Capital letters inflate routine without which days curve away. Describe an exile where the landscape is mute, muffled under plexiglass beneath a ball that does not drop. A person in the doorway, who feels the pull of the earth, a mighty planet third from the sun, where small talk is offered as evidence that one does fit in some place, where the characters have names, open and shut cases of assumed identity, and hold down their spots in a book, where the characters read the book as they are writing it, form and informant. In this book, the withered see with their own eyes and are therefore plump and spry. The young imagine a future flat and limitless amidst insurable and calculated risks in which time is a lake and the reflection of one space stares up to the sky behind. Each face is personal, each figure of safety of love is particular. Here's a gloss, kind of an index, a catalog of feeling. Approach to find one's tongue in one's mouth. Courtship to use an assumed name. Romance to pencil the present, to pack the brackets, to sight read weather. Request to test the heat for empty. To talk straight. Refusal to walk around oneself. Denial to have the last word. Flirt. She writes a text backwards to a curtained modesty. Appeasement. He paints himself in. Passion. Adjectives wag the dog. Passion. She takes a step back and can see herself fully in a darkened pane of glass in the kitchen window. Passion. He thought sentences had only two sides to them. You know, the bottom, the top. Now love multiplies possible positions. Hard. He throws his gravelly voice, shifts from where he begins and ends. Pursuit of motion, she breaks into the present tense. She spins through her skin, she shows her muscle. Erase of borders, she drinks draining the cup, thinks it's the same one she's poured. Stepping off, he is impatient to be that one with her. Stepping off, her subplot as well, their armor looks related. Immersion. They lock eyes and are surprised by the vertigo. He puts his thumbs in his ears and hears his heart unribboning, sound and rhythm in the distance. She feels like a paper caught in the updraft of a quiet explosion. Who lit the match? The lights flicker and it spreads. Every conversation ends with a question. Practice. The day today gives her an edge to stand on. How the calendar divides, fine grains defeat the measure, nor do others fit our preset containers. 
They are to each other the humblest examples of the chase elsewhere, meaning that feeling out of the corner of the eye. Practice, novelty repeats the new. To even speak, na to even speak the name she listens. Chance, she opens the door, ready not to know who she will meet next. The order of the story too, she opens the door. He is standing there with such complete attention. She turns around to see who could be standing in the door just over her shoulder. She doesn't know whether to smile, whether this will send the wrong message. She smiles at him. She wants to close the door. She opens the door. She comes to the doorway. She is nothing like he thought she would be shy in her own house. Her head is to one side, uncombed, unruly, spirals, but otherwise dressed and ready. He wants to say something to her. He wants to ask her, whose side is she on in the total war? The one without a name. Which side protects her in the exchange of bullets? Friendly or indiscriminate, the echo carves the air around them. Fire is trapped in his scar-stretched skin. The whole gunfire left is large enough to fill a room with grief, the doors locked behind him. Time for all of a sudden shortened. He wants to come back into this restful period of reasonable expectations, events with commas, the supple ease of free association. He wants out of the line of fire. He wants back into the ground taking from him in a chain of mistaken events. A thief mistakes him for a thief or a neighbor mistakes him for a housebreaker. A cop with the power of a gun mistakes him for a perp out of line. He wants out of the extreme. Clearly, he wants to say something to her. She watches him, the traffic of emotion on his face, becoming light or extinct one after the other. She opens the door wider as if to say, come in. He watches her face rise into focus. Balloons float out of the frame of the doorway, carrying her lines, her walk on scene, stage instructions. He watches this knowing there is more than one scenario, more than one way to connect the dots, more than one ending. He closes his eyes to imagine it, frankly, unretouched. It's an image of his own safety, his body flat moving along the camouflage of trees. So that's from local history. It was, it was really about someone that we had encountered when we were all young and had many roommates and someone who had, um, had gone up to a door, black man had gone up to looking for a door, a friend and um, it was the wrong doorway. So the cops came and shot him. And um, um, we had met him just a week earlier and had a good time at a party and he had nowhere to stay. So he stayed with us. And um, that was kind of the story of that. That's many, 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 many years ago and repeated many, many, many times in other situations. Um, I think I'll read, um, as I said, chronologically, and I thought um, I'd read my um, Peace Logic, which is sort of my book about commodities. <clears throat> Administering the Atomic Kingdom. Recently, the government cut funding for the, uh, this is, oh, so backstory. I had heard a story, I had heard something on public radio about um, United Laboratories, which is the uh, publicly federally funded lab, which tests American, uh, test appliances. And 
in, in their testing, they they break things, they ex, they subject appliances, electrical appliances to extreme conditions that you are always cautioned to avoid. Never put them out in cold water, never put them out in cold temperatures, don't dunk them in water, um, keep them away from heat. Well, the United Laboratory does all those things. And so they know exactly what happens when those appliances are put under duress. I was fascinated with this topic that they were authorized to break things and to deal with our um, the perils of our consumption. So um, I started writing these poems. One of them is called Administering the Atomic Kingdom. Recently, the government cut funding to the lab. Elected officials have sent staff to poke around and they have written reports asking unanswerable questions such as, why do we need a house of broken things? Surely we have enough broken things already. Things always break. Why fund what any infant knows as a fact? The facts are the facts, and these facts are buried in appendices that outnumber the pages of their books. At the House of Broken Things, reports cost hundreds of dollars per page, and the pages stack up. That practitioners have a dazed look about them prowling their labyrinthine laboratories. The corridors are a colorless twilight linking labs bursting with life science, cook with chemi cooking with chemistry, counting the beans. Through unimaginable numbers, the tools of destruction require careful oiling and preservation. Ever more precise numbers of iota management fill sheds. Keep, I'm sorry. Ever, ever more precise numbers of iota management fill sheds. Cubicle staffs respond to endless possible, endlessly possible inquiries, stretching mile after expensive mile. You see, the house is no bargain. It pays full price for its objectivity. This in a country of popular imagination where the facts are determined by election and the elections have fixed results based on the blessings of the highest bidder. This is a country within a country where the citizens are numbered in innumerable ways. Beltway commuters enveloped, enveloped in brown paper trench coats, curiosity at a remove, a pesky glam past the windows of their fellow farmers. The views are piled high with files Spare sweaters, seasons of office detritus, boxes, warranties, sales slips, running shoes, lunch menus, all bury the riddle of ink, typewriter keys that change the subject when the author is not looking. This is the world of objects we have made and their silent rebellions are conducted under our very eyes. The inventory gets out of line, undermines truth by numbers. There are unauthorized breaks on the line between one thing and another. The temperature turns out to have a profound impact on the nature of things. Winter storms tie up traffic. The original instructions are lost, rendering even the most precise coordinates almost useless for these things far from self-evident are undecipherable without them. All they are good for is company and they do not speak. The knee bone is connected to the thigh bone and the thigh bone to the hip bone eventually connects to constantly moving persons. In search of truth by numbers while everywhere the house leaks cold air. Wage to labor measured, paid hours zero down, made of maximized moments, only 15 seconds allotted per screw. There's little left to take home. The clocks are locked to tick, only the time objects keep. Whisked to the world's shelves, they can't keep them stocked. The goods sell so fast, manufactured by invisible hands. Well, since I find myself here, I'm gonna read invisible hands. Um, I like to read this poem, but it takes a little breath. Invisible hands trade down the block or around the world, down the food chain, from forward to back to escape the air grabbing heat. The crop fails, the monsoon in June, a fluke of the weather, a storm of flowers whipped into a rain that claims the last village. The residents head out to the city to make money and they never make the money they seek 
Instead, they make keychains, sneakers, baseball gloves, flame-proof nightwear, transmissions, stereos, computer chips, gap jeans, rugby polo shirts, dolls with the features of Norte Americanos or slave girls or Indian princesses living their lives in legend unlike their own except for an unlocatable middle. Just in time, the chain continues unbroken to unwind the thing after the thing, a line of never broken nouns. And if it breaks, we fix it quick so the chain can never be broken. Even if it shouts out a chorus set to shovel, the rocks never seem to disappear, but become dust, the dust that lasts from morning to morning, chained to a logic we are doomed to follow. Invisible hands rice the piece, spice the rice, circle the turns, turn on the presses, raise the letters, letter the spaces, address the edges before they bang into one another, mask the connections. Invisible hands milk the spill, ship the ink, jump the rope, rip the chute, lay the trail, time the tear, eye the glass, bat the wing, bat the lash, brown the tan, fiddle the sticks, ride the herd, read the horde, hear the roar, read the dim, damp the rhyme, rhyme the orange, toast the storage. Invisible hands carry the thread, thread the vowels, stall the calls, pour the molds, powder the walls, dent the bins, stamp the bills, core the questions, comma the nouns, time the charts, corner the squares, square the curves, loosen the jaw, spill the beans, spill the cats, feed the beasts. It's years before a family will follow off the edge of the ramp into this new life, putative new life, where the past has vanished and the present is all time charts marked invisibly. Only visibly hot in red dark of selective vision in plain sight and out of sight. One hand tries to clap the other. As in the phrase, give me some skin, the slap of palms, right hand to right hand, empty, no weapon here. See, we come in peace out of the hypnotic circle that orbits and holds us in constant bind of stick em up and lap dancing out of rigged destiny across the violent border of property and oblivion until, until, until hands can be detected in the bric-a-brac of the world. Hi, anxiety. We are careful never to take a trip together, especially the parents both at once by airplane or train. We leave separately on separate dates and meet at a location we don't disclose until within an hour of our rendezvous. We stay away from windows. Also large public places and famous spots, Grand Canyon might as well, excuse me, Grand Central might as well be another galaxy. And also Yosemite, the Parthenon, Victoria Falls and Shea Stadium. The Amazon is a remote possibility. We only eat food from cans or sealed in packages, food that has been registered and has a traceable record. Unfortunately, we had to eliminate any food that is red. As a precaution, we have set up our own cell with its bars, a uniform and an alarm system. We hope all of this is enough to protect the life we have built together. It's routines, wood, rock, paper, scissors, the threads. Um, I'm gonna read from Arcade a little bit. So I think it's begin to take a, a little bit of a more dystopian turn. Um, arcade, blistering routine. I muse through events until I'm in deep. So deep, I no longer notice the D or the P, the down, down, dirty dirt, the relative positions, who's behind the barbed wire and who's in front, within and without. The gagged angels of liberalism burying the hatchet in the social body, leaving it for dead. I don't notice a clock cartwheeling its way to the end of the millennium, the fix in the race, nor the tick and platonic bombs beneath the feet of an undecided public standing on a ledge anymore. I swim in this lack, swimmer in a salty non-solution, current events on one side, the present on the other, running neck and neck. Non-events sell the newspapers, but are curiously unreported, not even as consolation for the tense freedoms we don't miss. 
each day solved by a dozen analgesics applied to my sore spots from my hemorrhoids to my teeth set on edge, I travel to the world of work to face down the day to day until one of us surrenders. I go for bonus points by being closest to the train door when it enters the station. But the mood wears off and I can smell the stench of the anesthetic sting my nose as I begin the count backwards into a childhood powerlessness, a childhood where authority defers to your wishes to the point of forgetting all about them. I want to pull a tantrum, the emergency cord. I want to slam on the brakes of this moving forward, which is really a standing still at the station. The conductor comes on the intercom and intones an explanation as if he were the narrator and I was the ghost in interrelated and overlapping plots. We wait in the dark. We cannot tell if we are at the brink again or just in the middle. Are we on an incline or are we stranded? We, we are far, are we far away from any suitable destination? We try to scan the headlines at a polite distance. And of course, no one believes a word of what we know will be written there, even when they throw the predictable live bait before the blood bored crowds. We wear our indifference with dignity. In fact, it gives us dignity. It separates us from those who've been taken in or begun to fade in the glare of the bright arcade lights, the rings and buzzes crowding those who live the war game instead of play it just past the point where thought can be followed. Coda, against the complete dark, against bureaucratic seizures of the possible, against the body buckling itself, against the irregularities of desire, the multiplication of parallel lines meet over the fold in the mind, just past the point where thought can be followed, where the curve is constant, motion, displacing motion, checkers in black spaces and fluctuating light. Um, so I think this is kind of Reaganism. <laughs> so, um, you know, if I were to pinpoint what this is, uh, what this is, uh, the environment is trying to summon here, um, which is, uh, this kind of false prosperity and um, false sense of progress. And I, I'm paying attention to this line. Uh, we try to scan the headlines at a polite distance. Of course, no one believes a word of what we know will be written there, even when they throw the predictable live bait before the blood board crowds. And, um, and I would say that um, this was what I began to notice what we've been living for the last few years, which is kind of the bread and circus nature of um, the way news um, is presented to us. Um, more of the same mood here. Fortune, we haven't entered enough contests in one but we'll correct that. We'll break the bank and go from one to the other. Sweepstakes winners, lotto lovers. We're zero demons, a terrible crew of arivists, swilling filter and ordering books they don't have in the kitchen. Watch out. We will leave a winning streak in our wake like the sign of Zorro, like a hunter with her ear to the ground, looking for the next roll of the device, dice, like a window you can see through. Go ahead. Make some noise. This morning lives for racket. It makes the sun rise faster. Part fact, part fiction. We wake up to make ends meet. To make ends meet. I uh, think since this was mentioned in this seminar this afternoon, I think I'll read it. Um, Madam Narcissist. I have the power of simultaneous effect. It breaks off in a smile. I adore the arbitrary embrace of you. I light up the reader. Even my dark side is worthy of study. Every day my pennies turn a thought. 
I see my ideas everywhere on the brink of worldwide acceptance and potential profit. I believe my silence speaks volumes. I have as many layers as any serial killer. I'm in the moment. I play that game when I'm bored. I believe the story about the father who drove to work and left his child in back in the car, in the back of the car all day. I believe in personal contact. Nothing escapes my notice. Everything around me is subject to decay. I've lost count. I teach these kids more than they need to know. I have the same number of stitches. I don't know how it happened. I was just standing here. I know they are after me. I know the author. I already have a better angle on this. I do not go out of my way, so I am never out of the picture. Two. I am sentenced to think in lines running away and toward radical detachment where eyes lock. A tractor song imitates life art running down the rows. I think of selective flamboyance. Phone calls preempt the buzzless space around me. The trail gives out, vines cover it. I sweep up the impulses of intangible dread along with the prior generation's conviction that the rules of destiny entail implacable random betrayal where no good deed goes unpunished. Others mourn dead ironies. How are these truths truly related? I seek legibility. I read clouds, continental doubt. I tend to color the facts, unbinding private property so it multiplies. I hold on to time. I summon the past. Still my gaze simulates connection. In sleep, the brain wills it. My fingers pick out the thread. I'm doing good time. Let's check in there. Oh, okay. Um, I want to read a few other things here. Um, Um, I'm going to read, uh, yeah, I'm going to read some recent things. So I'm going to go into Veronica, I think, from there. Um, sorrow songs. To self immunize against provocation, she says every morning, the devil won't win today. Bills do show the cost of fatal forgetting. If we break speed traps, if we stroll topsy facey turvy, if we tell tell, we become consequence. If the truth comes out, they still think we're exaggerating. Gravity lands predictably. G-force ropes us into place. If you watch carefully, even jumps are tethered. We who oppose, who is this we? We who oppose, who is this we? We who oppose, against our worst nightmares. We, who is this we? We grow brighter in the dim fact of our condition, not to study the monster and forget to study the monstrosity, its persistence. If you blink, you might miss us. If you are always in the light of power, you would think there is a moat where we see a moth, an afterthought humming in the static the death march of counting what matters. Nowhere means every place is already taken to be curved or conditionally stopped. Where you are snapped into place, positioned and gelled into a line of extinction. A certain orderly decease amidst the mayhem. Don't interrupt, they got you. They got you. I get you, you have been gotten. 
You dangle from a possessive case, a case of possession. One coordinate shift to the right or to the left will slide you off the map, leaving an echo where you once were a blinking light, a persistence. Body double. What you need to know about this, sometimes I am that body looking for trouble. I find myself looking the way I behave, the way I'm suspected, fingering the scarf, the gloves, the flamboyantly priced street jacket. It's not even my style and it doesn't suit me, but it's irresistible because I could be sticky finger and according to legend, light fingered from moment to moment. Cancel the gavel of contempt and the constant enforcement of beauty. Sometimes perception is the jail that fills in the facts. The body and its image returns value more than words can harm you. The image of a man beaten. The image of a man beaten. 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 Broken, bloody. Body put on, rebeat. Sets the metronome in the back. Brain to static. Amygdala. Amygdalic crack attacks, metallic jaw set to imminent threat addiction. A life put on stall, filmed to repeat, edged in flames, drowning a mind in its almost death without dying. But poison set pressure, sky high to die. It rains on us daily, breaking the body in breaking news. A broken record. Rebeats are rebeaten hearts. I am wrapped in inscrutability, surrounded by volumes thick with ink of what they think but don't know. I am that arrow drawn against the machine of sure extinction. I want to drain the mechanics of innocence, which has never been a defense, obedience and three shades of violation and indignity. They are losing, they're losing because my collective noun is untying the knot they are because my collective noun is fighting their gravity. They are losing, they are losing. Because my collective noun is fighting the box with a ring and jumping the gun. Mm -hmm. Suspicious activity, and then I'll, I'll have a few poems after this. 43% of the people killed were not in the middle of committing a crime, but were stopped for suspicious activity. Arresting face. She abandoned the cloud and chose to go out on foot. She was missing a grin. She knocked at the wrong intersection. He defeated a match stick. He crossed diagonals. They moved past an uncovered spot. They lost pump. He was bowing in erratic directions. She ran by spurious gloat. They were potential troublemakers and did not fit the turned down dressing of the neighborhood who was speaking in concealed carry. He bolted out court dizzy thinking free from the lockdown. She traced the body that refused to fit a grammatical grammar of disappearances. She studied how black people getting excited in a manner different than others drive some people to blunt displays of panic and violence. She studied how black people getting elected in a manner broader than others drive some people to blunt displays of panic and violence. Lamenting in an appropriate structure has rendered her hoarse from not screaming. She is blind from reading from the inside of her lids and I would show you where it happened on a map, but the cursor of the public's attention has vanished. Let's see. Um, I'm going to read one, three more things, that's okay. Has the light 
Has the red light ever been this angry? Blinking, it reaches a boiling point. Stones wait to be thrown yonder, smashed in the rain of tumults, where someone somersaults around houses and clock chins wither in this diminished life expectancy, succumbs to ever the rule of claw, bald fists, yelling, the better to hear you, calling me what light suggests we do. Thorn, intimacy, mood brings me to kinship, calls me to dash and dash is dash. And this is the broken rule. Proxy desert, golden calf, run down souls, don't return your blinks, but stare into the drunk and no longer see themselves waving from the bottom. Prophecy in the uneven grammar of squabbles, stammer in the net of ancient hatreds. Who goes there? So little room on this narrow ledge. And that jittering high wire, will it ever stop swaying? Going off script, scanning, always scanning, eyes filling in the missing words, the unsaid, unmarked landscape scanning, looking for the deep end, the uncharted dips, drop-offs and broken walls absorbed by the child who sees and is not seen. Seeing and seeing more than anyone saw, seeing, taking on the skin, the scope, the scripts, the steps, stepping back and stepping, stepping out and stepping aside, out of breath. A second video, seven minutes long, is a sec second blow, sometimes a second blow or a third blow, an nth blow, blow by blow, repeating blows in which the police mill wait for an ambulance and EMT checks the pulse of someone's father, someone's brother, someone's husband, but not his breathless airway. The EMT walks away from the CPR that might have saved Eric Garner's life. Sometimes it is all I can do to read a poem or locate an image and suppose the consciousness of the person who made the poem and what lies inside the bracket of making it visible. And then remember that the reader, that's me, is also opaque until I read myself there, visible in that square on the pavement. Then I remember I am the one writing this word by word and line by line. I'm American made walking past a person clothed in rags outside of Union Station where they fought a war to preserve our penniless freedom. And this woman, man still wears that destitution like a worn coat when we won't touch that subject of class. For a long time, I knew I was not alone and I looked for writers like me out there, rule breaking, undividedly committed to freedom. I knew I would not settle for a paraphrase or a comma if it did not signal to be alive or alive outside of stereotype or standard correction or deviation of an externally defined norm the mean Negro, the unbreakable Negro, John Henry, a noble and predetermined blackness roped in by heroic invincibility to the point of, there's that word again, extinction. I break for reality. I break to go off script out of the safety of homelands and origins and into the future that lies outside the museum of my epistemological decease. I use words to escape the noose. I must make a break or turn into stone, into one of those statues some people want us to be guarding. I break even now to write whispering and rumbling and troubling language to scan, skim and divine. Join the march where I can meet others over the dilemma, define a common cause. What tropes need inventing, what new rope-a-dopes throw off the ropes, jam or jook, must we imagine, reframe, or play to new soundtracks. I think I'll end there. And um, I want to thank you again. Erica, that was stunning. Thank you so much. That was marvelous. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who's been listening and commenting. Are you OK for, to, for us to pose some questions yes. from the list? I mean, I think we'll. Sure. we'll Start with one, and then I think Lily will pose one that's been passed along. Um, while okay. you were reading Sorrow Songs, yes, 
you got to the line, we who oppose. And then there's in the text, there's a, this is page um, 178. Mm -hmm. And then there's a parenthetical in the text, who is this we? Yeah. In the drama yes. of the reading, you decide to read that a couple of times. And so mm -hmm. three of our listeners, Jayla Rhodes, J. Ward 199, <laughs> and Quinn Gruber, Quinn Gruber also all asked, but really, who is this we? And Jay Ward said, who is this we? Great question. And Quinn Gruber said, who is this we? How does the we relate to the social body? Would you like to take that on just a little? I mean, we who oppose, that sounds pretty good. That's a good we. Those are allies. But then mm -hmm. the speaker asks, who is this we? Almost with a tone. <laughs> well, you know, it's the, um, it's a, uh... You realize that inside any word, there's at least a, a few senses of that word, right? And there's yeah. the we, right? We who oppose, that's the we, we, right? And yeah. then there's also this question of who is the we really? And are we all on the same page, as it were? <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? and, um, and then there's also the fact that we is situational always, right? So it depends on the context. So there's at least three um, possible uh, perspectives on that on that we. That's what I love about a pronoun. It's really um, yeah. there's it's malleable. Mm -hmm. Is the speaker um, allowing a, another voice, another version of her voice, or someone else's voice to question assumptions right there in the middle of the text, parenthetically and does that change the course of the poem? It changed the course of the reading, I think, of the draw of the- Yeah, yeah. well, it's a, you know, as I said, uh, I think in another context, um, or actually in this context, I said, you know, that uh, the performance is, an, is one activation of the poem. And the poem is one particular way it appears. And, um, and then the performance is a, a, can take it as a score rather than, right. you know, classical music, you play the music the way it was written. <laughs> In jazz, you play the music and then you, um, you know, you um, improvise. And you felt at that moment that the we needed to be questioned a little more emphatically than the text. I get that. Thank you. Um, while Lily uh, cues up a question she's going to pose, let me just read off a couple of names of audience members just so you have a sense of contact with them because I know reading in a Zoom while everybody's in YouTube is a little distant. Uh, Cole Swenson has been here, Sawako oh, Nakayasu, uh -huh. Joan Ritalik, uh -huh. Julie Patton, Leanne Brown, JC Todd, Bonnie Costello, hey. Evie Shockley, Hello, <laughs> Pierre Doris, and Tanya Foster, and many, okay. many others. So okay. there they are. Good to um, see you, or good I'm glad you could come. <laughs> they see you anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lily, do you want to pass along a question? Yeah, just um, to start off, a, a few people were wondering if the final poem that you read, Erica, um, is published somewhere that they could revisit, or if maybe that's part of your new work um, that you mentioned in classical. Oh, uh -huh. that's, actually, that's actually in a, um, I think it's in a boundary too. Um, I think it's in a boundary too. It was written, it was actually an essay, but it's kind of a poet, poet's essay. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Could you, would you mind repeating the title so we could look it up? <laughs> oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, going off script. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, that was kind of a technical question. Now I'll ask a, an audience question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm kind of interested to know, Billy um, Augustian, I hope I'm saying the last name right, said, I'm so interested in understanding the parts that you sang in Invisible Hands. Can you say more? Mm -hmm. The parts that I sang? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, again, it's um, um, increasingly, I'm interested in the performance dimensions of uh, any text. And so feeling that I can sing it, um, I can scat it, I can um, uh, repeat parts of it. Um, and, it, you know, so it's, it is instantaneous. 
Um, and then also Invisible Hand is most is is both a work that exists as a you know um, a kind of reflection on all of the work that supports that we don't see that supports us in our lives and we become more aware of essential workers and all of that. But there's also a whole structure of unrecognized, invisible, erased work that makes modern life possible. And so it's it's also a meaning, it is a it's a you know a um it's a reflection of that as well as an acoustic poem. Uh, two two related questions I'll pose both of them uh, and you can kind of pick and choose or go off any direction you want to obviously. Um, Sophia Nas, who's a poet uh, we admire, uh, says so much power of your poetry comes from its performance. I'm wondering if you perform it before or while you are writing it. That's one question, a, a twist on the performance. And then Sophia DeRose, one of our students you met this afternoon, uh, asks, how do poetry and performance converge or diverge as genres? What is your relationship to genre in this respect? You want to deal with either of those questions about performance? Um, uh, you know, there are many. Um, um, there, right? Poetry is is uh, image, music, syntax, and uh, form, as well as thought and feeling. So those five things, and poets gravitate to one or the other. Some poets are very cinematic very visual and some poets are, you know, very much about the syntax and the structure of the words and so forth. And um, one thing that I do write, I do write, sometimes I, I hear the poem before I actually know what the, you know, I'm in it and I go, oh, there's some, some music here. And I sort of move along with the music and put little marks if I don't quite have the word yet. And then I go back and put words, you know, so I, there's a very important acoustic quality, sonic quality for me in poetry. Um, having said that, um, um, increasingly I'm interested not only in the sonic quality, uh, sonic quality has always been there, but it's also like, what does it mean? Also, what does it think? What am I thinking? How, what am I really thinking here? And that's, that's also important. But poets can gravitate to any of those five things that I named before and sometimes in various measures. Not everybody does everything, right? So. Thank you. And thank you, um, Sophia, both Sophias, for asking that question. Lily, do you want to pose the question Padma Sini has asked? I do. We just got a great question from Padma Sini, who um, we know through her involvement in ModPo. Um, she says, <laughs> The word legible appears in several of your poems. In Reader, We Were Meant to Meet, there is a line, Reader, you are meant to be legible. Could you please, um, I think maybe the word talk is missing here, please talk about the concept of legibility and thank you for a wonderful reading. Thank you. Um, so um, I play, it's a uh, Fort da. <laughs> Freud, okay, it's, it's really, is it there or isn't it there? And so I like to play with this notion of legibility, illegibility, what is legible? Um, sometimes things are not legible until you write it. Sometimes you don't know what you know until you write it down. It's right, you sort of go, you're thinking something and then you, and then you go, oh, look, I do know this. And you, you, you get excited, I get excited by you know, going further and further with, with um, the details or going deeper. And it turns out I know more than I thought I knew about an experience. I write that experience then into a different kind of legibility, including possibly the reader. There is also though correspondingly an idea about opacity. There are some things which are going to remain ambiguous and to acknowledge that as well. So to play on both sides of legibility and illegibility, not to say that one is necessarily better than the other, but certainly um, to understand that writing, like say developing a negative in a photo, you bring things up to the surface and you see it becomes palpable, legible. Wow, that tells us so much about your, your poetry. 
I'm so glad that question got asked. Uh, thank you, Pat Massini. Um, I have a question of my own that has to do with a poem that you read, Suspicious Activity. And it follows from this question about legibility and opacity. It begins with an italicized quote, which is saying this thing that many of us have thought a lot about or already know, 43% of the people killed were not in the middle of committing a crime, but were stopped for quote unquote suspicious activity, which gives you the title. So the poem is set up by something you found, I assume this is a quote word for word. Mm -hmm, I guess yeah. the first question would be the basic one, which is did you be begin the poem by thinking about this quote and write it from there. And the second would be, this is a marvelous poem that tries hard not to make complicated problems easy. <laughs> and therefore the whole question of suspicious activity, police profiling people by, by thinking of simple solutions to complex problems themselves, <laughs> the poem itself becomes a, a response in its very form. And it's very demanding a right to opacity to the simplicity of profiling. Does that make sense? And would you like to comment on that? Those are two parts of the question. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, when I saw that, uh, you know, that statistic about 43%, right, of murder, of murder by police, you know, or killings, at least, a lot. began by this vague, this vague thing, suspicious activity. Everything can be a suspicious activity. I mean, under that, what is this, you know, so I, it's, um, it's a it's a an ending dragnet, right? Um, any kind of uh, interiority, any kind of um, uh, thing that doesn't somehow meet some predetermined norm of what's not suspicious mm. activity, yeah, yeah. becomes um, a, a a threat. So um, I I wanted to push that. Um, I wanted to push this idea that. Um, uh, that simply being um, black and um, or uh, a person of color or somehow you know trans or whatever, you know that many ways of the many ways that that is uh, the recognizable human you know that this is okay this activity here but not here and the, I guess the big example is we have many contemporary examples, the bird watcher and the Barbies watching birds, but black men are not supposed to watch birds <laughs> or something. Suspicious activity then becomes just being human. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Erica, uh, would you be willing, before we thank people and say good night, would you be willing to take a request for an encore reading of a poem? Really? Yeah, okay. Wait, it's a short <laughs> okay, one. Sure. Would you be willing? Okay. Where is it? Uh, I'm thinking that it would be wonderful if you ended this occasion, this wonderful occasion, by reading Time Slips Right Before the Eyes on page 133. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's very nice. Someone's asked for that. Lo okay. Lovely, lovely poem. The whole, that it's a multi piece poem. Well, I was actually page? thinking of the ver one short page. version of it that's in the selected poems, the one page version, yeah. Oh, the Sorry. one, oh, you yeah. got it. Okay, yeah. okay, because I was like, oh, that's- Yeah, 133, right? Oh. Mm -hmm. mm. Time slips right before the eyes. The past is imperfect. It is unfinished. Story. She said, did I ever tell you this story? A story that tells and forgets, told to me by a loved one who forgets, who she tells her that what she tells, she told me before, before she forgot in time, worried she might forget over time, who she loves, who won't forget, who she loves, one moment to the next. Erica Hunt, thank you. Thank you so much. While I'm thanking some other people, yes, snaps. While I'm thanking some other people, I hope that those who are watching and using the YouTube chat will just say good night and farewell to Erica, and I will pass along some of those good nights and farewells. Thank you to Thank Zach you. Cardner in the virtual Writer's House studio, Sophia DeRose, who apparently was live tweeting this event, 
Allison Del Pino, who gave a marvelous introduction. Thank you, Allison. Lily Applebaum for coordinating Writers House Fellows. And people are saying good night. Billy Augustian, thank you. Hayden Sonier, thank you. Mia Marion, Deb H., Deborah Greenberg in Chicago, Lainey Brown, thank you, Erica, wonderful thank read. You. You're a dense, thank you. Brian Early, thank <laughs> you. Robert Ferran, mm, okay. Rima Hort mm -hmm. from the class, Jamie Lee Jocelyn, Carissa Cliff, Derek, sorry, Decker Walker, have Messini again, Rachel Kulik, Suzanne Margano from Germany, or originally Germany anyway, Sophia Nas, Pierre Joris, wonderful reading, Erica, thank you very much, says Pierre, Quinn Gruber, Thank you so much, everyone. Erica Hunt, we'll be back at 11 a.m. tomorrow, Eastern time. We will make sure everybody sees the link, but if you go to the Writer's House YouTube page, you'll find the link, and we'll be doing an entire session of questions, answers, conversation, and response. This has been an event of Kelly Writer's House Fellows. Erica Hunt is our Writer's House Fellow. Thank you again, Erica. This was a marvelous evening, and good night to everyone.